Hey everyone, welcome to another comics loving edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Here, reporting live from the scene in the eye of some nasty weather, is comics creator Steve Ekstrom. Steve, thank you for jumping in, joining, and I hope things are, are going okay where you are. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we're just under tornado watch, whatever. Yep, yep, yep. It's you know, Florida. It's you know. Florida. Yeah, I used to live in Tennessee, same thing. We had some siding on the side of our house. That's where siding would be, siding on the side of the house. That came off, and it was like, it sounded like someone was beating our house with wood. So, um, but, but yeah. sending the smooth vibes there and peaceful, peaceful things for you. Um, so, how, how do I transition this to Creative Storm? Um, you, you have a, a storm of creativity that's on the way. How's that? <laughs> Uh, I believe there's some fog involved in this storm. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, nice, nice, thanks. Um, you also have, you, you've created in comics with titles like Capable. Uh, and I believe you got your start, if my researches are correct, in the world of comics journalism. Yes, yeah, I was, um, I actually got started a little earlier than that with MySpace. I started reviewing books myself. Nice, nice. Um, but then I met someone, uh, a guy named Troy Brownfield, who uh, asked if I wanted to join his little squad of book reviewers for a website that also fed into a major website's weekly posts on book reviews called uh, Best Shots through Newsarama.com. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I started out reviewing books. I reviewed books for about six months. And then by then I had kind of worked my way into a journalistic role. And I became a major contributor for one of the largest entertainment websites on the web for about six years. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. So so what was the journey like from there to creating comics a as a writer yourself? Well, I had already, I, I had been reading comics since the late 70s, spinner racks, drug stores, grocery stores, you know, the way that they used to be distributed, gas stations, mm -hmm. um, for the most part. Um, any kind of news stand. And um, I had had little aspirations of doing that as a child and, and as a teenager, but I didn't know how. And you could buy, the, like the only prevalent book back then was like How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way by Stan Lee and mm -hmm. John Buscema. And uh, I, you know, I just kind of, I fell into becoming a writer. writer writing found me, I think is a better way to put that. And um, I ended up switching my majors a bunch of times in college and wound up in creative writing. And I was actually a trained poet educationally. Oh, awesome. And um, I won uh, Academy of American Poets Award at the age of 24. So it was like the student one. Um, they are kind of tiered to it. Um, but I won one in 2001. And um I, when I graduated, my dad was in a hotel room visiting for my graduation. He was like, well, what do you want to do? I said, I'd really like to trick, try to try to foray into comics. And he was just like, well, I live in San Diego, son. You should come <laughs> out and go to Comic Con. Yeah. And, and I'm from rural Georgia. So it was like, well, I don't really do conventions. I, I don't, what, what good is that going to do? And he was like, you got to network. Mm -hmm. And any small convention I'd ever been to had been like vendors selling back issues like a comic book store. Yeah. Yeah. I've never met a professional that made these things. I got like a postcard from Larry Hama, the writer of GI Joe. And I was like nine years old kind of thing. Cause I wrote in, but that, that was my extent, you know? And so I had started kind of going out there every year to visit him in the summer to go to Comic-Con. And he would, the first couple of years, he kind of went there with me and, held my hand a little bit and kind of, it kind of gave me some coaching on like how to approach people professionally, have business cards, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I started then finding more books about like script scripting, you know, screenwriting. And um, I developed a script writing format and I started kind of developing little ideas. Um, as I was at Newsarama and I was reviewing books, one of the last acts I did that was like a big deal was I went around to a, a convention and I bought a bunch of independent creator creators books and I reviewed that I reviewed a major like an anthology that that had come out from a small studio in like South Carolina and um 
I just thought it was really cool to see young people making comics and it's kind of roughshod, you know, and, and I just was very kind and I provided some criticism, but I, you know, there's, there's smarter ways to do that than just being like somebody at a workshop and you're just brutalizing somebody right? Yeah, with your, yeah. with your critique of their, with your, you know, assertions of their work. And so, um, I got contacted back and they were like, Hey, thank you. Nobody ever does this for indie comics of this nature. And you went above and beyond and you did this really you know, thoughtful review of our project. Would you like to be in our next year's project? We'll give you some real estate. And I was like, yeah. So <laughs> I, I didn't know how to get an artist. I didn't have any money to pay an artist. I didn't have all these things that you, you know, you have to have to make good comic. So I went on like forum boards and stuff. This was back in 2007. And um, I met a guy through the forum board that was looking for a project. And I was like, look, dude, I'm starting to gain traction on this website, this major website. So at least, and, and I did the, the thing that nobody says to do, you know, don't offer exposure, but that's all I had. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was waiting tables. I had a two-year-old. I was trying to figure my life out. And um, I eventually, like Doug, his name is Doug Draper. And we eventually made an eight-page story that I taught myself also how to letter comic books during that time period. Nice, nice pardon me and um it was a it was a real chore because i wasn't very good at it and wasn't very fast and there was a lot of knowledge about it on the internet but you still it takes a lot of refinement and learning how to use major computer programs like uh, adobe illustrator and photoshop mm -hmm. and um I, so i'm like learning like five things at once i'm juggling chainsaws while i'm riding a unicycle and um, but we got a, a story out. It got published in their anthology. A year later, it got published in, at the time, what was like the best anthology to be recognized in. Uh -huh. uh, it was called Negative Burn. And it was an industry-leading anthology where if you were going to be somebody that was going to be somebody in comics, you were likely published in this at that time. Uh -huh. And I was published in the second to last issue of the, of the print run of the second series. And... Um, and then I got contacted again by a, another website that was like, hey, if you get this colored, we'll, you know, we'll put this on our website. And um, it's top shelf publication. So uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen mm -hmm. from hell, the surrogates published my short on their digital brand. And it was just kind of I'm, I'm just matriculating upward. You know, it's yeah. And um, yeah, and it just kind of kept snowballing while I was being a journalist. And I did the thing that is a, a, a contest through DC Comics called Zuda. And it was like a web, it was like, you know, like America's Got Talent and you're, you get voted on. I took third in, in a month. Uh, I got in a really weird spot where I thought my, con, my credentials were going to kind of ease me into some stuff. And I, I was, I, I was really kind of foolish about that. But, um, you, you know, you have to network and you have to social media market everything. And there was a, the comic that beat me and the other popular American writer who's, I can't name is passing me, but we were both about the same level and kind of coming up. And there was this cartoon out of Brazil, this comic out of Brazil about like a six fingered guy that could play air guitar and blow things up. It was really weird, <laughs> but it was very inventive. Mm -hmm. But he had, you know, when you think about the marketing and, and the potential, when you're somebody that can go to like a Brazilian TV channel and go, hey, I'm competing for a spot for an American paycheck at DC Comics, mm -hmm. they put them all over the TV in Brazil. I, I'm just a little guy from Podunk, Georgia, who has some clout. And so people were looking at this guy's comic just voraciously. But the runoff was touching me and the other guy that were vying for second and third place. So we all wound up with about 60,000 views, which was more views than any of the pre preceding comics ha had, apparently. Mm -hmm. But he had just enough to be insurmountable. And it was like really weird because we were like just neck and neck. And I wound up in third, but it was a really cool learning experience. I had written a comic. Basically, it was like, the Manchurian Candidate from Outer Space meets Johnny Quest. Nice, nice. It's called the Aries Imperative. But yeah, and I just kind of kept doing more things. And there were times in that period where I would languish. 
Um, I spent a couple of years kind of like I met somebody and moved around and, you know, life got in the way. Uh -huh. I produced a web comic in 2014, 2015 about a historical event in the Soviet Union in 1923 that resulted in cannibalism that went unreported until the 90s when the veil, the you know, the, the veil of communism fell and researchers were allowed to go into the, you know, the cities. And this French researcher just found these documents that were transcriptions of communications between, you know, Stalin's people and this little remote outpost near Siberia that was next to an island the size of four football fields where they basically took a bunch of work labor prisoner type people and um, deposit them there with literally 2 million metric tons of flour that wasn't even bagged. It was just a pile of flour on the bank of an island in the middle huh. of a river. No supplies because, as we all learn, capitalism and communism are failed by greed. So, like, the best people, you know, the best communists got the best stuff. And uh -huh. the further out they went, they got less and less supplies. Ba basically, they were told... You can die in the woods of exposure or you can build towns for us. Mm. And that's basically how communism got their start in Russia was with these labor camps that sound very familiar to different kinds of camps. And yeah. uh, Hitler got his idea from for his camps from Stalin's labor camps. Wow. So, wow. yeah. So Cannibal Island was like a little web comic that I produced. And but it just. When you're working and you're trying to monetize something and you've got a guy that is doing the art for you, but his life is also complex. Um, we just couldn't get on the same page. I got about 22 pages of it made. Uh -huh. And now I'm looking to kind of revitalize that as a re actual graphic novel. Um, nice. And then, you know, I, I kind of just matriculated over time. I started charging money for my lettering and editing services because I had this literary background uh -huh. that kind of was went hand in hand in hand with punching up people's dialogue or like seeing issue with, uh, you know, like story narrative arcs, things like that, or problems within the, the narrative and dialogue that were driving your ability to turn the page since mm -hmm. we're, you know, it's a visual medium. Um, so I started kind of doing that for a while during COVID. And then I met uh, one of the publishers at behemoth comics, which, which is now Sumerian comics. Mm -hmm. and um we just started pitching things and when the fog came up ironically i had watched the movie it's one of my favorite scary movies from my childhood yeah um because it was like the second one i watched because back in the day they would put them on nbc and they'd be like really edited you know deeply edited like i was one of those people that watched halloween in like 1981 mm -hmm. when it was dropped on tv um like halloween night to promote halloween 2 that was in theaters and um, they did the same thing with The Fog a couple years later. And I watched it when I was like, I think, seven or eight years old. And um, it just really, you there was a boy in the movie. And so it was really relatable to have this boy your age uh -huh, being uh -huh. stalked by these leper pirate ghosts. And um, it, so it just always struck a chord me, like, you know, core memory established kind of thing. And... Um, when I got the opportunity to pitch for it, I just started having these, these ideas, like what happens to a town, you know, like many, like modern, like something happens in 1980. What's mm -hmm. that place look like in 2022, 2023. Yeah. And I just imagined a place that kind of probably suffered for a while. Then all of a sudden with all of the paranormal podcasts and the paranormal TV shows, it becomes this kind of, destination vacation spot <laughs> right. for these sorts right. of people and then i went what if people from the original movie still like live there like the boy he's all grown up he owns his own fishing boat and he has a small commercial fishing company and his wife owns a you know and she's from another prominent family because the original movie was about prominent families that had double crossed a basically a captain of a sea vessel who was try he was basically taking people with leprosy and trying to find a remote location uh -huh. to put them somewhere. And um, the, the town turned on him and stole chart, gave it, took a lot of his money and then burned his boat with everybody in it. And then they came back for revenge. So 
I wanted to take it away from that because at the end of that movie, that revenge, that desire for revenge is sated. It's, it's slaked by the fact that they get this gold cross that they took all their money and they, you know, they get this gold cross from this church that this guy is hiding mm -hmm. and the pirates should be done. You know, when that, like what kind of, what other thing are they carrying? So I came up with this thing that was grounded in local lore um, about a guy that was found in the woods when he was like three years old, like naked, didn't speak. Family found him in the woods. This was in also in the late 1800s in rural Georgia. And um, he was they, my, my, an old history professor of mine called him the man from nowhere because later on, many years later, because they were interested in figuring out where this guy was from, he was exhumed. And I guess his DNA didn't lead to anything. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I thought so, too. I, I, there's nothing about it on the Internet. This guy is just steeped in local historical fiction, though, or not fiction, historical facts. Sorry. I work in fiction. <laughs> um, and he would he would drive me around like sometimes we would just ride around together. He's a friend of my mother's who ended up being one of my history professors. And later on in his life, he, you know, needed help going to doctor's appointments and stuff. So I would just drive him around or we'd go have lunch. And he would yeah. tell me about something like a haunted church. I'd be like, let's go see it. And he would take me out to it. <laughs> and um, I've seen some stuff and it's it's wild. So getting to write, getting back to the fog, um, I took some some local lore and kind of um, shaped it into part of the premise of my sequel, where this guy was found in the 1880s when this initial event happened, when the bur bone was, the bur boat was burned. Mm -hmm. And... He now he's he's in the original movie. The character is in the movie for about 30 seconds. Yeah. And he's at the very beginning of the movie. I don't want to spoil it beyond that. But um, he shows back up in the town and he's like in his 30s. And he's here to he's and he's somehow controlling all of the malevolent entities and poltergeists that are surrounding this area that is just steeped in paranormal kind of energy yeah. and it he turns the town inside out and andy wayne is now a grown-up who has been harboring this like survivalist mentality that he keeps hidden in his basement and he just and it's like he shows up to nothing's going to take him from his home or damn it you know endanger his wife and kid and his mom and uh it just kind of derails from there let's say yeah, yeah. Well, um, you shared the first issue with me digitally, which I'll be glad to put the cover like right here between us if you'd like. Um, yeah, that's good. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm curious about as as far as kind of the craft of it. Um, what's it like to try to build suspense in a comic, and particularly suspense that's built on this kind of like story that you love, story that you grew up with. Um, I think a lot of it has to be because the scope of opening a book is you have, you, you're seeing what's coming. Right. So right. you have to kind of build your element, you know, let me put my hands here. So, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking here at, at page two and page three surprise elements have to happen after the page turn. So on four. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to plan and pace your book in a way that allows for those sorts of surprises. And so you have like cliffhanger, like you almost like there's Freitag's pyramid. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but in creative writing classes, you're taught about, yeah, you're, it's, it's basically your rise to the apex of the story, to the climax. And then there's a denouement mm -hmm. that unravels and ends the story. Well, you're doing that. I I'm trying to create like little miniature Freitag's pyramids every time you're turning a page and then you reach the final, uh, you know, the last page of the issue and you've got a cliffhanger yeah. and that way you're waiting, you know, these things come out every 30 days. So you have to give people a hook. So they go, Oh man, I want to read the next one. Yeah. So I think that uh, like the first issue I, I, I had, you know, they tell you the scope of the project up front. So I know how many pages I have in runway. I have to land my plane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the first issue is kind of just naturalism. And I, I find that Carpenter's work, and I wanted to pay homage to that so much in everything that I did here. Mm -hmm. 
has a really nice humanistic element that is especially in things like Halloween, you know, which is my favorite movie of all time, 1978. Yeah. And the fog has it. And there's just this like natural warmth of, you know, this comfort of humanity. And then just outside of it, is, you know, is inside of this little bubble of warmth is the things that can get us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to kind of harness that, you know, first I wanted to establish all the characters. I wanted to establish a little bit of tension, dramatic tension in front loading facts about this world. And that way that you have enough of a working idea in your head as you read, because the most important part of this is the reader, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in comic, because you have this, this, this thing that you do, because comic books are focused on rising and falling action. So when we have a panel, because we don't show real movement, we show the illusion of movement. You'll have a cop. He's putting his hand in his jacket. He's edging back and you see his foot raised up. And then the next panel is his foot going through the door and the door slamming open. Mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. your brain does everything in between those panels, does all the legwork. Yeah. So I have to come up with clever ways to create, moments of that per by the page and every page can be different there could be seven panels on a page there could be three panels on a page but in between those things there's movement there's shifting camera so it's almost like quick cuts in a movie uh -huh. and um yeah so it's it's to create dramatic like the first issue is so much setup and there's just this little like um this little tiny grain of sand that you just can't seem to find. And it's, it's right along your hairline. Mm -hmm. And then, so you've got this guy at the very end kind of walking along the side of the road and there's the storms coming and yeah. it's just very simple metaphor kind of thing. And his, you know, this child is riding by on a bicycle and rides right by him, you know, cause she's trying to hurry. And, and then you just kind of know, okay, evil's coming to town kind of thing. Yeah. But like, there's enough details about, who they're investigating that it, it kind of holds your hand. Like, I don't, I don't want you to do a lot of guesswork in con. I don't, I don't think good comics have a ton of guesswork because you're informed, but you're informed in, in such a way through dialogue or like directly mm -hmm. that um, you're, you're omnipresent, you know, you're omniscient, you get to see above. Um, I like, you can still be surprised that way though, because of the nature of how you have to turn the pages. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm curious about when the issue comes, any details you want to share as far as um, sort of the, the plan for the number of issues and, and anything where readers can find out a little bit more? Um, well, basically what just happened is called Final Order Cutoff. That was last weekend. And that doesn't mean you can't order the books, but what it does mean is you have to actually go to stores and say, hey, are you carrying the fog? If not, can you order a back order copy for me? It'll be like maybe it might be on time. It might be a week or so before they can get it. Mm -hmm. But you can back order the number one book. And with most independent companies, most small volume and medium volume stores can't take a lot of risk in ordering. You know, they can't order 100 copies because they don't know if they're going to move 100 copies. You know, right. Spider-Man probably doesn't move but 30 copies in a, in a small store. So... You have to kind of you, you kind of have to go in and, and pre-order the book. Um, it's a four issue miniseries. There are in the first issue, there are six variant covers. So you can get like cover A, cover B, cover C, cover D. And then cover E is a one in 2000 sketch blank. So it's actually got it's like white, which is ironic since it's called the fog. So it's like people are kind of going apeshit over this cover. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, that's actually funny. And it's just <laughs> yeah. this blank white thing with the logo on it. And I was like, man, I didn't even think that through, but that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. So there's only 2000 of those being printed. So, but they, and I think they cost um, $8 as opposed to like five um, because they're on a different style of paper so that artists can actually do a sketch or an image of whatever you want on the cover from the cover, from the book. Mm -hmm. And you can have it commissioned and then you can grade it and stuff. And then it becomes a unique ID item. And then there's a one in 25 variant by a woman named zoo or zoo and um basically for every 25 copies of the book that was made from the standards they make one 
of these as a way to give retailers incentive to order more so that they can mark the rarer book up to sell it to collectors. Um, I'm also in the process of uh, putting up my website for sale or uh, for web sales, and I'm going to have an exclusive variant also. Um, and I, it'll be a virgin variant, which I had a guy, I had a commissioned an artist named Drew Raglan to do my own cover. And it'll be basically um, Andy Wayne coming out of a bank of fog, holding this beautiful tactical shotgun. And um, it won't have the logo on the front. And then I'm also going to have another iteration of that. That is even rarer. That's has a foil based cover with the same image. And those will be sold on my website and at book signings that I'm going to be doing in the, in the next couple months. Fantastic. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's basically go to comic shops, request that they order this thing for you while you can. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us the website as well as any particular spots on your visits that you know that you're going to be making? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can look up Steve Ekstrom on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on uh, Instagram. It's Steve.Ekstrom. I don't really use Twitter X anymore, but I'm on there. Um, I'm on, I have, I'm almost capped on Facebook, but I take friend requests from people who are interested. And um, my web address is kind of funny. Um, it's Steve Ekstrom dot rocks. Um, we just bought it a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I want to use Big Cartel or, or Shopify right now. And I'm just I just need things that are point and click because I'm a 47 year old man who is <laughs> starting to become problematic with technology. And um, yeah, that's about it. But the website should be up in the next week or two. And I will have regular copies of the fog for sale also on there if, if people have a hard time. And if they order it through me, they might pay a little extra, but it'll cover shipping and handling. And I'm going to sign the book and make sure that it's packed properly and things like that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Steve, thank you for the time. Thank you for the conversation. And glad to have you back anytime to talk about more issues of the fog or other projects that come to be.